April 15, 1912, the RMS Titanic is already filled with water. Above the din of steam coming from the safety valves, an officer is shouting, Women and children first! He's acutely aware that there aren't enough lifeboats for everyone. A woman looking radiant in her dinner dress clings onto her weeping child as they're guided onto a boat. Her husband stoically nods in their direction. When they're out of sight, he just stares into the distance. He knows that's where he's heading, into the freezing cold waters of the North Atlantic Ocean. Another passenger, a complete stranger, hands him a camel filterless cigarette. Do you think we'll make it, he says. The husband doesn't reply. He just keeps looking forward, transfixed on the dark. With great violence, the ship suddenly tilts. A giant wave sweeps many passengers into the ocean. Can this man survive even though he won't make it onto a lifeboat? What were a person's chances of survival in that frigid ocean? Today, you're going to find out, and you might just be surprised. Ok, so the ship hit that iceberg at about 11.40 pm. As you already know because you've watched the movie 15 times, it didn't just sink in the blink of an eye. In fact, for the first hour, the majority of the 2,224 people on board had no idea just over 1,500 of them were about to have a date with Davy Jones's locker. The ship was letting in water from the beginning, but the flooding was incremental and slow at first. It took about 40 minutes for the loading of the first lifeboats to happen, boats that were filled with only women and children. This was somewhat problematic since some of the boats hit the water only partially filled because not enough women and kids could be put in them. When lifeboat number 7 rode away from the sinking ship at about 12.45, only 28 passengers out of a possible 65 were on it. It wasn't until about 1.20 am when the flooding got much worse. That's about the time the ship tilted more and those on board really understood the gravity of the situation. It's when couples said their tearful goodbyes and when the guy in our intro saw his beloved child for the last time. Well, if he died, we'll come back to that soon. We hope you have your fingers crossed for this dude. And just in case you're wondering, it wasn't as if all the women and children were spared that appointment with the freezing cold ocean. Of the 412 adult women on board, 108 died. Of the 112 kids on board, 56 died. That's a 75% and 50% survival rate, respectively, which isn't bad going at all. The men did have it worse. Of the 1,680 guys on the ship, 1,357 ended up with an unwanted sea burial. That's only a 19% survival rate. Add that up and you get 1,521 deaths. Some sources say 1,503 died, others say 1,517 died. Let's just agree on the number of deaths was in the early 1500s. Titanic the movie wanted to encourage you to be angry because it portrayed a scenario in which wealthier people had a greater chance of survival. This was a British run ship. Still, today that country judges you by the strength of your accent and then puts you into a class bracket, and back then people were a lot more obsessed with class. Titanic the movie got it right in some ways. The wealthy did fare better than the poor. Although that bit where the third class plebes are locked behind doors down below is totally fictional. Let's break this down, something we'll call class mortality rates. If you were a rich woman, you'd almost had it made. Of the 141 women who bought first class tickets, only 4 bit the dust. That's a 97% survival rate. One posh kid died, so that sucked for him. Of the 171 men in first class, 105 died. Get this though, of the 179 women in third class, 91 died. 55 out of 80 kids who were staying in that crappy part of the ship were killed. 391 out of 450 of the men in third class died. In terms of betting, if you were a woman without much cash, you were an odds-on favorite to die. In all, only one quarter of third class folks survived when 62% of first class folks survived. It also turned out that Americans had a better chance of survival percentage-wise than the Brits, and it was those two nationalities that made up the bulk of the passengers. So we can conclude being a working class family from Wolverhampton was not the ideal demographic for sailing around icebergs in those days. To give you an example, let's look at the Sage family who was immigrating from Britain to the land of the free. Mr. Sage and Mrs. Sage boarded the Titanic in England with third class tickets and nine kids in tow. None of them made it to America. The Anderson family from Sweden also had a third class ticket, and all seven of them perished, as did the English Goodwins, also a family of seven, and another family looking for a new start in the USA. Ok, so let's get back to our stoic man who's just bid his farewell to his wife and kid. Not too long after he smoked that cigarette, the ship tilted 30 to 45 degrees. The cacophony was absolutely deafening because the ship was coming apart in the water. The lights were still partly on, but then there was flickering followed by darkness. The people in lifeboats looked on in shock at the shadow of the behemoth sinking into the depths like a slain sea monster from a Greek myth. The crashing, the screaming, the surreal image, it was almost unbearable to look at. On board, 
some people were being thrown down the now heavily tilted ship. Some of them were literally pulverized after being smashed against fixed objects. Others flew through the air like ants in a hurricane. As the ship pointed skyward, those who'd managed to cling together in groups fell in mass hundreds of feet. Some of those people ended up in the icy water, and believe it or not, a few of them were still in one piece. Others were not so lucky. They were cast into the sea only to be whacked by all the debris that came from the ship. Stuff like giant pieces of timber and bits of beds. The theory is some of the debris went down, but being buoyant, it came back up with a vengeance, and it hit the ill-starred swimmers. Maybe that was better than dying slowly in the freezing water. To say those survivors were cold would be an understatement. One of them later said the feeling was like being pierced by a thousand knives. The temperature was about 28 degrees Fahrenheit, which didn't give people much of a chance of surviving. People did survive, though. One of those people later said all he could hear was a terrible moaning sound, a situation he described as being horrifying, mysterious, supernatural. Some of the folks in the lifeboats not so far away said they felt hopeless as they peered into the darkness and listened to the poor souls whose moans were carried by the fog. The situation was dire, to say the least. You see, water is very dense. In fact, it's over 800 times more dense than air. That might not mean much to you, but it will if you ever find yourself immersed in very cold water. What it means is that in the water, you cool down a lot faster than you do when outside in the open. In fact, the chilling is about 25 times faster. Let's say you weren't one of those passengers that swallowed a load of water on impact and so your lungs didn't drown. You'd still be breathing very heavily and your teeth would be chattering as if they were powered by a generator. You'd also have the most horrific headache. The reason is nerves. They send a message to your good old brain and your brain thinks, huh, this guy's head is freezing, better send some warm blood up there. Your brain is now your enemy because the warm blood causes swelling and you get that terrible headache. But why do people shiver and why do their teeth chatter? The reason is shivering activates muscles to get moving, and this warms up to the tissues in your body. Shivering is good for you. As for those mad chattering teeth, that's because all the muscles moving causes the jaw to spasm. If your teeth ever start chattering and you're not cold at all, you best go see the doctor ASAP or a psychiatrist. Back to our man in the ocean. He's now been in the water for a few minutes and is fortunate enough to find some flotsam to grab a hold of in the shape of a rather well-designed cabinet. He's hyperventilating due to shock, but that's not so good for him. Too much of that can release too much air from the blood, and that can lead to reduced blood acidity. The upshot of that can be fainting, which is not great when you're in the water. But our guy, he's one of those strong, silent types, and he ain't gonna let a bit of hyperventilation bother him. Plus, he's got that cabinet to hold on to. The problem is, he's now shivering so much he almost looks like he's about to have a seizure. As we said, shivering is your friend in times of coldness, but it's a different matter when you're in the ocean or perhaps stuck on a mountaintop. That's because in those situations, you really need your muscles to work for you. Our guy is shaking around on his cabinet, and that's really not ideal. He needs his muscles working fine, he needs his strength, but because of all that moving around at times, he almost loses his grip. He's strong, but he's no Wim Hof, aka the Iceman. Not the contract killer guy, but the Dutch guy that's trained his body to withstand extremely cold temperatures. Because our survivor is not trained like that, his brain is in a kind of fight or flight mode. As you likely know, a bit of this is good for you, but too many stress hormones firing up that amygdala in your brain is not good. All of this stress has caused our gracious man to have some internal problems. For one, his arteries have shrunk, and so his heart isn't getting the blood it needs. That means his starved heart is pumping like crazy. Meanwhile, that selfish brain of his is portioning out the blood to only the most vital organs, including it. What that means is all those less important parts of the body aren't getting as much blood, and some parts are going numb. When those parts get really cold, they no longer work so well. And when the bloodless parts get super cold, the extremities can get frostbite. Suffice to say, our survivor has cold toes. Now he's been in the water for about 10 minutes and basically he can't feel his feet. His greatest risk right now isn't hypothermia, although you'd think it would be. The biggest problem is the fact that when his legs and arms get too numb, he won't be able to either cling to that cabinet or even swim. This is known as cold incapacitation, and it's likely the reason most of those waterbound Titanic passengers died. Most people in that water were slightly incapacitated after only two minutes, but after 15 minutes, they were virtually paralyzed. In terms of drowning, that usually gets you before the hypothermia does. That's not happened yet, though. What's also a stroke of luck is even though his heart is working overtime, he hasn't had a heart attack due to the narrowing of blood vessels. 
It's just good fortune that the star of today's show is as fit as a fiddle. To survive in freezing cold water, strength, conditioning, and a healthy ticker are required. Even so, his body temperature is not what it used to be an hour ago. His regular 98.6 has been reduced, and if it goes below 90, he can say goodbye to consciousness, which again is not great when you're in the water. Still, people aren't all the same, and so while some of those moaners kick the bucket after only 15 minutes, 20 minutes have passed and our guy is still holding onto that cabinet. Albeit, he's now turned a shade of blue and is not sure if he has any legs any longer. Lucky for him, most of his upper half is on that floating debris. At around the 25 minute mark, he's moved from stage 1 hypothermia to stage 2. The first stage includes what we've already talked about, but now things get worse. We should say here that some people are just amazing. The record for surviving a body temperature drop in the water was someone who was once pulled out and lived to tell the tale even though their body temperature went down to 13 degrees Celsius or 55.4 degrees Fahrenheit. That shouldn't happen, but it did. He's now feeling kinda tired, and he's even stopped shivering. But that's actually a really bad thing even though he feels better. He's losing his mind, and though he's able to hold on to his raft, he's kinda drifting in and out of reality. Part of him is in the water, and the other part is having a picnic with his dear wife and kid on an atypical English summer's day when it actually didn't rain. He's tripping out because his brain cells aren't getting the oxygen they need. This can also work out in his favor, since when cold the brain doesn't need as much oxygen. What that means is he could go into cardiac arrest, but his brain would still be functioning. That person we just mentioned, who holds the world record for having the lowest body temperature and surviving, actually went into cardiac arrest and survived 40 minutes in an air pocket before being pulled out of the water. Since her brain was in chill mode and working, she was revived and later ended up telling her story on CNN. Ok, so he's in stage 2 hypothermia and things aren't looking good at all. But then a lifeboat approaches, and it brings him out of his reverie about that picnic. He can hardly be excited given his body is so numb, but he can hold on. He's not out of the water yet though, both literally and figuratively, because there's a chance he might die from post-rescue collapse. This happens to about 20% of people who've suffered some serious hypothermia after being in cold water. A person can be dragged out of the water and go into shock, or they might suffer a serious heart arrhythmia, or their blood pressure might dangerously drop. That doesn't happen and our man became one of 14 people pulled from the water. Those lifeboats could have actually saved a lot more people, most of them in fact if they'd been on the scene earlier. He certainly was a resilient guy because the rescue took 30 minutes and by that time almost all the moaning in the water had stopped. Believe it or not, after an hour when hundreds of dead bodies were seen floating in the water, four other men were found. Three survived and one died from post-rescue collapse. Our guy was fine. He went on to write a book called Why I'm Never Going on Vacation Again and he even stopped smoking. Now you need to watch 50 insane facts about Titanic you didn't know, or have a look at why is Titanic still at the bottom of the ocean?